many of you like reading the comic strip in the newspaper? In fact, it may be the funniest thing you'll ever read in a newspaper. Usually it's filled with tragic or uh, distressing news in many cases. Uh, but one of the comic strips I love is Broomhilda. And I remember a few years ago, uh, Broomhilda is sort of this disheveled uh, human being and cries out to the gods, uh, what must I do to be good? And the gods respond, well, give up your nasty ways and love other people. And Brunhilde considers her a moment and says, what's the second option? <laughs> and I thought, Brunhilde is ready for Lent. Because Lent is a time when we're called to uh, look at our lives and take time to do it. You know, I, I think in this instantaneous generation, one of the real problems uh, with instantaneous communicate. How many of you have felt this? They get text messages or an email and you've almost got to respond right away. And if you have friends who, are, who can't actually get irritated with you if you don't respond right away. Um, do you remember the, the day of new letters when it might take six weeks to get a response back or several weeks to get a response back? Now people get upset if you don't respond right away. And so there's this constant pressure and speed, and sometimes people almost want to cry out, I want to get off, because it's going round and round and round and round. And so Lent is a wonderful time to actually get off, sit quietly, look at our lives, and ask the questions which come up through our scripture passages, and in particular, the series we've been doing on the Lord's Prayer, taking verses from the Lord's Prayer and working through it, in Lent. Now, to give you a brief recap, the, uh, cap, the Lord's Prayer is designed as a pattern for prayer, not just a recitation. This is the prayer you must use. Jesus is responding to a question to his, from his disciples about how to pray. And so like many rabbis, Jesus gives them a pattern for prayer. And so What's really important in the Lord's Prayer, although using the, the, the words Jesus has given is a very good practice, and in fact, we do it on a regular basis in our liturgy, is to actually look at the pattern and the concepts that Jesus is giving in each of the verses to help us learn about the meaning of prayer and how we draw closer to God's love, which is really at the heart of Lent. Because when we ask forgiveness, the second question is, if I've been forgiven, how do I draw closer to God? How do I experience God's reality in my life in a deeper way? And so I want to reflect on the verses this morning, your kingdom come, your will be done, or thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Now, what's really interesting is that's not a request, a petition, which much of our prayer life seems to be that. We pray for people or situations, which is good supplication. But this really is a cry of the heart that God's kingdom would be present in our world. And sometimes when I read the newspaper, I wanna cry out. I mean, the events in, in New Zealand are just another of a daily series of tragedies, many of which never make it to the newspaper, of the incredible violence and evil that people are able to perpetrate on one another. It's sad. And if you really want to be frightened, consider the fact that numerous nations have more than enough nuclear weapons to annihilate the entire planet several times over. And all it takes is one button to be pushed, and that's the end of everyone, not just a group in one place in, an, in a, a tragic event. So, I mean, that's the world we, we live in. So how does... What is the gospel, the freedom of the good news? What does it mean for God's kingdom to come in, in the world in which we live? Well, the first thing is that with Jesus coming and being born and then dying on the cross and paying the cost for our sins, he opens a door. The kingdom comes in. And the message is that if you turn your heart to God, you ask for forgiveness, you are forgiven, and the potential for healing and reconciliation with God takes place. And no one can then say, no one loves me. Because the gospel says, God created you and loves you. More than you will ever know until you see the Lord face to face. And 
the reality of that is no one is ever alone because God loves each of us. Jesus said, I will abide with you until the end of the age. I will never leave nor forsake you. And sometimes we have to hang on to that promise because when we go through those desert times in life, doesn't it feel sometimes that you're alone in the desert? And you wonder if anyone really cares or understands the pain or the situation you find yourself in. And the truth is that God loves you so much that he died on the cross and that when we accept that forgiveness, God also sends the Holy Spirit to indwell inside us and begin to change us from the inside out. I call it an interior car wash. Uh, And some interesting things happen when you pray this. When we pray that God's kingdom comes, we're praying that God's kingdom is not just in the world around us. And sometimes that's our first kind of uh, default position. We think of the world as ours, but have you ever thought of God's kingdom coming in you also? That's what you're praying. Your God's kingdom coming in you. So the really interesting question then to ask is, what does it look like to have God's kingdom in me? And that is a transformative question. Because when we ask that question, and during times of prayer and confession, we realize that there are areas of our lives that really do need to be transformed and changed, that the kingdom really would come in those areas, and you know where they are. We each have them. Sometimes they're in relationships with siblings or family members. Uh, Sometimes they're letting go of past ways we've been wronged in the past, and we carry it with us, uh, bitterness and anger. Uh, God wants to heal that and let the kingdom come uh, inside us. Sometimes it's in our attitudes. Paul uh, speaks about the renewing of the mind. I always found that really interesting. It's the renewing of the spirit inside us, but it's changing the way we think and perceive other people. If we really understand other people as created in God's image and that God loves them, no matter what language they speak, no matter where they are, no matter how different they may appear from us, God made each person. For for Christians, there can be no prejudice because all of us are made in God's image and God loves each of us. And if you start with that premise, the renewing of your mind, suddenly the way you deal with other people and the way you value other people changes. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Wouldn't that be revolutionary at the United Nations? I, I, I had a chance, you know, I have these fantasy moments, but this one actually came true. I was standing in Nairobi at the United Nations Forum. They have an office in Nairobi. And I was standing at the lectern where the speakers give their addresses. You know, it was empty, we were doing a tour through there, there but maybe eight or nine people with me. And, uh, but standing at the lecture, and I, I thought to myself for a moment, what would it be like if each human being on the planet valued every other human being with love and compassion? Would we be spending the money we spend on weapons to eradicate each other, or would we be spending that money on healthcare, education, and caring for each other? I, I, now, I, I know we live in a broken world. I get that. But how many of you want to cry out, God's kingdom come. And then I recognize that maybe I can't change the thinking of everyone there, but maybe God's kingdom starts here in me. And it's my attitudes that need to change first. And that as that change comes, you get a compassion for the people who are homeless on the street or who need assistance in a food bank. Or it's the neighbor who's lost a loved one and needs just to be surrounded with some compassion, care, and prayer. Or someone is lonely, or most difficult of all, someone is bitter and angry, and they just project it out at everyone else, and people stay away from them. But they're really crying out to be loved. This is a dangerous place to be here this morning. Because God wants to change each of us and that we don't leave here the same way we came in. And so this week, I would leave you with this question. What does it mean for the kingdom of God to be in me? 
and what needs to change that the kingdom of God might find fulfillment. Now here's the also wonderful truth. When we pray that thy kingdom come, we're also praying for the second coming of Jesus Christ. That when, God's, uh, when Jesus returns, the kingdom in all its fulfillment and promise is realized. We live in this in, awkward in-between time. But one thing we can do is be transformed by God's love. And so I just want to give you two thoughts around that. One is be praying that God would show you things in your life that need to change. That would be the first prayer. The second would be, God, send your Holy Spirit to help transform me. Transform my ways of thinking and relating to others. There may be some things you need to let go of that you've been carrying for a long time and recognize that God's forgiveness and love is for you. And be free. You know, that's the other thing I wanna say about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a place where you are truly yourself and set free. And what an amazing thing. You can be free and not be afraid of death or the challenges that come with growing older or all of that because you're loved by God. And we know this is not the end of the story. It's, it's part of the journey. Be transformed, let God's kingdom come. And that is the will of God for you. Your will be done. And what's God's will? I want to leave you just a very simple summation. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, and love your, as your, think about those three things. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.